and welcome to The View from the African Regional Conference 2015. I'm James King, the banker's regional editor, and I'm joined today by Lesetia Ganyago, who is the governor of the South African Reserve Bank. Governor, thank you for your time today. Thank you, and welcome to Cape Town. Thank you very much. Now, you've just finished your opening speech for the conference today, uh, and you touched on some very interesting issues with respect to regional integration. And obviously, when we look around the continent, uh, as you mentioned earlier, we're seeing very promising uh, uh, integration projects taking place you know, in East Africa and West Africa, but also here in, in Southern Africa. Um, when you look around, how encouraged are you by the progress that's been achieved to date? Um, it's uh, very encouraging. Um, but I'm particularly proud of the uh, integration project in, uh, uh, in Southern Africa. And um, strikingly, the, it is finance that's integrating faster than uh, all the others. And, um, and you know that finance is settling for, for goods and services. And the disappointment is that it is still very ex fairly expensive to move goods uh, across the, uh, the African continent. The way in which our infrastructure was uh, uh, established, it was established to take things out of the African continent to the markets in Europe, Asia, and, uh, uh, and the US. And uh, when we looked at um, basically three basically payment systems integration projects in, uh, uh, in Africa, one in West Africa, one in East Africa, Southern Africa was a slow start in terms of its uh, uh, payment regional integration, but when it took off, it took off very fast. It started in 2013 with uh, uh, countries that share the uh, common monetary area, being South Africa, Namibia, Lesotho, and uh, and Swaziland, and um, that was the pilot uh, project, and it got accepted by the Committee of Central Bank Governors in uh, uh, Southern Africa. And uh, we now have nine. There is a negotiation strategy and advanced stage with the fourth country. To we are assisting them uh, to get their uh, gross real-time settlement system uh, uh, going. And we had reached that important uh, milestone um, the last week of, uh, uh, of April when we uh, cleared the um, up to uh, uh, one trillion uh, rent cross-border uh, uh, settlement. And, um, and what we have also established is that but 43% of settlements that used to take place through the correspondent banking system have now are now taking place uh, through the uh, CIRES uh, uh, system, and that is very encouraging. Now, historically, regional payments uh, across the continent have been typically settled through correspondent banking arrangements. Um, but what kind of impact will these regional integration projects like CIRES what kind of impact will they have on sort of on business on the continent, on economic growth? What will be the tangible outcomes? Look, I mean, firstly, is that it facilitates uh, it facilitates a, a, a payment, and uh, as I say, some of these payments take place real time. Um, uh, the challenge is always at the background. Payments are taking place real time. Are the goods getting delivered uh, uh, that fast? And that is the challenge. Uh, the challenge behind. So in terms of efficiency, there is no doubt that uh, these uh, payment systems are cheaper than using the correspondent banking systems, which is why transactions are migrating away from uh, correspondent, uh, correspondent banking. But I guess it also poses a challenge for correspondent banking itself as a, uh, as a product. And, um, uh, and some of the banks which are offering those correspondent banking services have actually joined Ceres. They are becoming clearing banks in Ceres, which, which means that it's the fees are going to have to be uh, to be and uh, to be earned differently. But there had been also another uh, driver which we've not quite had our finger uh, on it, which has to do with the fact that uh, correspondent banking could be coming down because of the stringent AML CFT uh, regulations, uh, which are welcome. They have to be there in order to uh, to combat uh, uh, cross-border terrorism or local uh, money laundering activities uh, but that um, uh, the manner in which uh, the financial sector and some corporate have responded uh, to it seems to have uh, gone over the top uh, themselves i mean we know that you have to know your customer 
And when you talk to some of the bankers, they say, well, they have interpreted it. says, no, you must not just know your customer. You must also know your customer's customer. But that kind of requirement is not there. It's not in the FATF uh, requirements. And neither is it in any of our local regulations. But I think that the, the extent to which uh, uh, institutions had to pay the fund, they are, had become ultra cautious with respect to this. Okay. And you were saying it's, it's just hard to gauge how much... Uh, impact those regulations have had upon the migration from sort of correspondent banking to these regional payment systems? It's difficult to gauge how much of it would be as a result of AML, CFT, things like that. Mm -hmm. Within Cirrus itself, we have got standards on uh, AML, CF, uh, CFT, and the fact that we are now seeing the migration into this is just testimony to the fact that the system is such an efficient way of uh, transferring money uh, across uh, the borders in Southern Africa uh, than uh, utilizing correspondent banking relationships. Now looking ahead in your speech you mentioned the next key step uh, in this development process is getting these regional systems, these regional uh, payments uh, programs to sort of speak to each other and to engage with one another. Uh, what's your take on, on the prospects for that as, as we move forward? Well it's, I guess it's, uh, it's, uh, it's all about people. I think one of the things that has come through is that this had been almost like driven by uh, uh, central banks and uh, uh, and so forth. And in the final analysis, it is uh, businesses that trade. And um, uh, it's not government that governments that trade with each other. And to the extent that different regions are trading with each other, businesses from different regions are trading with each other, there would be a business case for um, systems to be talking to each other and it will then post the thing that says that the operators of these three systems would need to agree on what are the common uh, standards, what are the common security uh, protocols and so forth that would then enable settlements then to take place across this, uh, uh, these three systems. It might end up being something that you clear within say Ceres and if there is a settlement that must take place between Southern Africa and East Africa, for example, that the two systems operators have some protocol to do that. And uh, it becomes crucial because they are now basically what you would call uh, Africa multinational companies that are operating in all of the three regions. And it would probably be them that would basically be saying that, Tell on, there is a case here, we have to move the money, and uh, the current arrangement does not quite uh, suit us. And I think that it would be an opportune moment for, for, for us in, uh, uh, in Africa if we could have these three systems uh, talking to uh, each other and thus facilitating uh, cross-border uh, payment settlements. Fantastic. Well, a lot of hard work ahead, but definitely going in the right direction. So uh, it's very encouraging to hear. And uh, thank you for your time today, Governor.